and happy to be sharing my work with you. Um, I'm going to do sort of, I'm going to, I have a, pre a prepared presentation, but I'll do, um, I'll, I'll share it and then I'm going to run through a few and I might not talk about those. So I just want to give you that warning. So I'm going to share my screen. Let me know, um, you know, how it looks. Um, okay. So I'm going to start by talking about much older work, work I made in 2006. And um, when Lori invited me, she asked me to come up with the title and I came up with the title, op The Optical Unconscious. And the reason why I use that title is because there's a book by um, Sean Michelle Smith that is titled The Optical Unconscious that I really connected to. And I started giving it to my students. I teach at the SMFA at Tufts. I, I started giving it to my students in a class that I created that intersects psychoanalysis with photography because I'm a trained analyst and I had a clinical practice for seven years. So my way in, in sort of um, growing and seeing my, my, my photography practice is very much connected to understanding my unconscious motivations, which I feel get revealed um, as time has gone on in my practice. Um, and I think that that's very much connected to how Freud saw the negative, um, you know, in analog film, he saw it as, as a metaphor for the unconscious that would then be revealed in the positive. So I highly recommend that book um, if you, if you haven't, you know, if you haven't, uh, seen it or, or, or read about it, I'm going to talk about these pictures because I like to talk about things chronologically. Cause I feel like when I, when I look at like all of the work I've made over the last two decades going on to three, um, feeling old, but you know, good, <laughs> I feel that it's, all connected. And, you know, sometimes people will tell me that things feel different, but I really feel like things have always been about the same thing at, at the core. Um, so this work I made in Panama in, in gated communities called Costa del Este, and that's the title of the piece. It's Costa del Este. Um, and I started making them because prior to moving to Panama, I had already lived there for a few years in my 20s, like on and off, like one for Fulbright and one because I wanted to make a failed documentary about my mother. Um, I chose to go back when I was in my early 30s and just wanted to see what if I could, if I could make it work being an artist living in Panama. <laughs> so I took this huge risk and I moved there. And part of my motivation was I was really interested in this new development um, that was going up that really mirrored the exurbia that I was photographing in New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, and I'll, I'll show a couple of them. Actually, I, I feel like I repeated a couple of those images in the slide presentation, but I'll talk a little bit more about it. So this was made in um, Connecticut prior to having moved to Panama to make what I just showed you. And I'm kind of showing a little bit of, of it in reverse. Um, and it's because this work led to that work. And I feel very often that like, you know, my work works like that, like a Russian doll, like one thing leads to another. Um, I became really interested in the new exurbian communities, partly because I was working in those spaces, in those environments. I was, I was teaching at Community College of Randolph in New Jersey, which took like two hours to get to. And it, when I first started working, it was like farmland. And then like pretty quickly, it started becoming like, you know, like exurbia. And then Bush won the election. And I read this article about how the exurbia population was really responsible for his winning the election. And that got me very interested. And so I found myself really wanting to get inside. And so this was something that I really only came to the realization recently that I'm very interested in this idea of people self-segregating. I'm very interested in sort of these communities they create for themselves. And I was very interested in, particularly in these exurbian communities, because they were homogenous. Um, it was, you know, for me, it was a sign of, of racism, of them wanting to separate themselves from cities and, you know, like that white flight syndrome. And it also felt like, you know, a population of people that I wasn't really in contact with myself, like, like maybe I was familiar with 
these archetypes through television or media, but it wasn't something I was personally really, you know, familiar with. So I really wanted to get inside. And the same is true for Cosa del Este. When I, then when I moved to Panama, you know, so like I branched this project out and I wanted to get inside, but what I found was that I was getting inside these very wealthy people's homes and photographing children and, and women primarily. But what I became more and more interested in were the domestic workers and the relationship between the domestic workers and the children they were caring for. Often the mothers were not there. Um, you know, they may have been out getting their hair done. There were often like multiple domestic workers. Um, and so again, I was like, <laughs> found myself inside places that I was not really familiar with. They weren't really my places or spaces. Um, and I made this work for about three, I guess three years. And then I grew very depressed of it because unlike the, the children and women in American exurbia, these children probably saw me as a domestic worker because there was this segregation that they had, you know, they created sort of a bubble for them, for their lives. And I was so outside of that and they saw me probably as hired help or something. I feel like their understanding of what I was doing in their house, taking pictures of them was very um, foggy. So it, it grew kind of depressing for me. Um, but I, you know, it, it's interesting how in retrospect, I, I, I think the pictures, um, I'm really, I really don't regret at all having made them. I mean, I guess I'll say that, you know, I feel like, um, I feel that they're very valuable. They're they're real. They're important documents. But I then, you know, started making these images around me of people that I was more. You know, they were more in my world. Like these were neighbors that lived two streets from me, and I would see them all the time. And I just thought they were beautiful. And I asked the dad if I could photograph them, and you know, he let me do it on more than one occasion. Um, so I started. I, this was I was still living in Panama, making these pictures, kind of like trying to sort of make photographs that were outside of the Costa del Este project um, of of girls primarily, and you know, their experience in nature. I also was like really trying to, you know use how beautiful Panama was and and that you really are you do have more access to nature there in a way that is very it's very unique um and then what happened is that I moved back to the U.S. and I really moved back partly because I just for my practice and for how I like to make photographs I just felt like I couldn't make it work there financially um it was very torn about that because I really loved living abroad and I loved living there but I just felt that I couldn't really do it um, cost wise for, you know, production of photographs and just all those things. So when I moved back, I had in mind um, to photograph my mother, who had been my first subject. And I knew that I didn't want to do it um, in a way that was documentary because I really wanted to talk about things that I felt were too complex to talk about in a documentary um, approach. And so I, I started thinking about, you know, like what I had really come to understand in the years that I was living in Panama, which was the complexity of um, hierarchy of um, skin shade and the importance of it. And this coming from colonization and from the history of colonization and also the Caribbean, because Panama, although it's in Central America is really considered Caribbean. It has like a Caribbean culture, you know, with so much like intermixing of enslaved people, people from the West Indies who came later to work on the canal, Chinese, you know, so many different people, indigenous, a lot of indigenous people. And so most people are mixed. And so <laughs> because of colonization and the internalized, you know, racism that they're taught and also the segregation that the Americans brought too. So it was the Spanish racism, of course, but then it was the continuation of that with the American racism and the segregation because the Americans created a gated community. So here we go back to my thing about the gated community. And it really was just like a couple years ago that I was like, oh my God, like I, you know, I started making pictures like drawn to people in gated communities. And really what I was doing was exploring 
my mother's experience growing up in Panama City, which was like a gated community where the Panamanians were shut out from the canal zone and couldn't go in unless you worked there um, or had some reason to, you know, to be there to be visiting or something like that. Um, so I wanted to talk about this complexity of history, really. And I feel like I'm always really talking about history, you know, history and the contemporary. Like I'm always trying to like make those two things intersect and see how they how they are completely connected and one talks to the other. And so I started this project, which was really very much about my mother's family, the women in her family and all the stories that she would tell me <laughs> like multiple times, you know, like I kind of had them floating in my brain and I just thought we could perform those stories and she could play all these parts. So to make them, ironically, I really wanted to make them in Central America, primarily Panama, but then we made a few in Guatemala. We made a couple in, in, um, in Nicaragua. I had a friend there who invited me to go and I went. Um, so we would go abroad, you know, we would go to these to these countries. Sometimes these were um, like museums, like this one is a museum in Guatemala City um, that probably still exists, you could visit it. And so I liked the idea that, not just liked, I needed the, the environment to be part of the history. So like I wanted the architecture and the spaces and the artifacts to be, the primary protagonist of the work. Um, so this home was, this was a 200 year old um, house in Nicaragua. Um, this is also Nicaragua actually. <laughs> this trip was really complicated, but we got a lot of really good work done. So, you know, it was really, I loved working with my mother. I always felt that she was very enigmatic. This was part of why she was my first subject. She was an enigma to me. And part of it was cultural. You know, I grew up in New York City, had this Panamanian mother, didn't quite understand her culturally, felt like through the camera, I could maybe get closer to that and then move there in order to get even closer to that, right? I really, I think it was all about my mother. Um, so, um, you know, I think that then directing her for me <laughs> was just like, you know, the ultimate like performance act. Um, you can hear all of the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the the sounds of my neighborhood um so you know in terms of some of the the things that are happening in the pictures a lot of them are sort of um like like jokes you know like this magazine is like a magazine that is is very popular for people that are very interested in like the Spanish um, royalty and follow them and like feel themselves very identified with Spain, which is like a classist and racist sort of symbol. And so, you know, like, so, so the story is that there's two twin sisters. One is of lighter skin shade and there's a domestic worker, but they're all played by my, by my mother. And then sometimes I include myself um, as a character, as one of the daughters. Um, so, any questions, please put them in, in the chat. I don't mind if you interrupt with questions. Um, a lot of the pictures were made sort of just like using the environment we had in the moment, sometimes because things didn't work out. You know, I remember when we went to Nicaragua, something didn't work out with a friend that invited me. So we ended up just like making it work. So a lot of the pictures were made, you know, like having ideas, maybe maybe sketches and drawings, but then arriving and then like maybe that would fall apart and we would figure out another way to make it work. But one of the things that I love and I and and that I think I came to in the last decade is like the act of performance and using the body and the somatic, you know, in the body and how things get revealed. And I loved that my mother was like a natural actor in this in this way, you know, like she just, she gives a lot, like she gives a lot in both roles, in the domestic role and in the role as the, as La Dama, you know, which is, you know, like a kind of um, a woman who's, you know, probably single or, or, or divorced or, you know, um, and, and she knew, and she could step into it without 
a lot of instruction. That was the thing that was most fascinating to me. I didn't have to give her a lot of instruction. She would just put on a, an outfit and sort of like immediately step into that role. And this is just an image to show you sort of like how big they were more or less and how I framed them. This was a show at the National Portrait Gallery that I had, I think in 2014. And then I sort of, you know, a few, a couple of years went by, I was living in in, in the States again. And I was becoming more interested in this chapter of my mother, grandmother and sister and her sister immigrating to the States and what that was like. And when I was small, my grandmother lived in Woodstock, Virginia, which was a very small rural town. And I would go down there from Queens where we lived to visit her. And it was very impressive to me. And I really wanted to explore that um, chapter in my family history. So we worked on these pictures um, after working on Casa de Mujeres. So I see them as two chapters um, of one project, really. And, um, and it's, it becomes about immigration and about shift in identity, really, is what how I saw it. I really saw like, you know, the way that the women are feeling about themselves and their identity in, you know, in Panama, in, in Latin America is different from what happens to them with a new history that they are taking on. And so that's what I wanted to address with this series. And we made them often in like bed and breakfasts. <laughs> you know, I, I was looking for just sort of like colonial-ish um, spaces that reminded me of like the Americana type furniture that I would see where my grandmother lived with her husband. Um, I made this character that's supposed to be my mother juvenated by um, photographing myself um, in the same place and then like laying on pieces of the face. So in some ways I also saw her as a mask, like wearing a mask. Um, so, the the character the younger character has pieces of my face in on her um you know i feel like a lot of the pictures were influenced by 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 movies by american films which i was always watching as a kid i was kind of obsessed with american films um, and so there's a sort of like, you know, I feel like I'm integrating some of that love, uh, into the images. So then, um, that work with my mother came to an end. It was like about a five year period. She just was like, I'm done, <laughs> like find other people to photograph. Um, and I started making some pictures that I, really still really like I see them as sort of like more I don't know more experimental and they're photographs that are about um really American cinema and I was looking at a lot of for instance I just heard an interview of Rita Moreno I don't know who else heard it on on public radio talking about how she had to darken her skin in every film she did for many many years including West Side Story and so I was very interested in that you know like um how American films were depicting, you know, women of color, um, ambiguous sort of ethnicities, you know, like darkening them and like strange accents that were just completely just like from Accentlandia, not from anywhere specific. And I, I was just making, I made like a few photographs that were sort of about that. And they were kind of like an explore, exploratory for me. And then I started, um, working on this film, this, this video, which is, was not my first one. It probably, I think it's my second one or third. And, um, and so it's, it's really kind of like using American media. It's a combination of, of, um, of dialogue really that comes from several scripts, American films, uh, uh, Heather's West Side Story, a little bit of Rebel Without a Cause and The Pawnbroker. And it's really about immigrant children um, in, in the United States, you know, in a small town that are caught in, in between, like in a liminal space and feel tremendous guilt and a tremendous need to be, to, to integrate and feel accepted. So I'll show you a clip of this. Let me see if, okay. 
Mama, Mama, are you happy? Are you happy? There are more important, are more things, important than happiness. things than happiness. Like, like what? what? Survival. Survival. Heather Chandler is from an all-American family, descendants of the Mayflower. She walks into the kitchen, her parents read in silence. I'm leaving now. I'm leaving now. I said I'm going to school I'm now. I'm going to school now. Have a good day, dear. Have a good day, dear. Dad? Dad? Dad. Will you be Dad. home tonight? Will you be home tonight? No, Heather, I'm sorry. Uh, no, Heather. Work. I'm sorry. Too much work. Maybe your, Maybe mother, your will mother will be home. No. Mrs. Chandler sips her coffee. Um, Heather lives with her father in Percival. He became a refugee after the genocide. Now she looks at a magazine, Better Homes and Dad, Gardens. Dad, I'm going to school now. Dad, I'm going to school now. Yes, right. Nianzima. Nianzima. It's Heather. Heather, remember? remember? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. I remember. I remember. By the is way, how school, is school? Uh, going Are well? you studying? It's fine. Yes, yeah, Daddy. Dad, look. Dad, wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be, be awesome like to live in a house like this? It would be fine. But it would be fine. But that's not changing. changing you. I know you. Whatever. Okay, so <laughs> this was from, I made this in 2015. Um, and yeah, it kind of amazes me how, Mom. sorry, how, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have my son at my feet and I don't know what he's telling me right now. <laughs> this is like, okay. Um, I think, I think for purposes of time, I'm gonna skip this second excerpt. He just wants my phone, I'm sorry. <laughs> um no and i'm going to yeah i know so it's i'll so just, just to be so sorry I'm, i'll go to the second uh well this is a project i'm going to skip over because it's it's i i feel just for for time i'll just kind of like run through it quickly but it's it's like a a, a, a project that is really st it's really under construction and it's about family portraits but um, then in 2017, I made this piece about Gauguin, which is also film, but I also had photographs that are collages too, that are, you know, connected to it. And I'll show you a clip of the film. You will ask to make a portrait. What is there, just a portrait? into your eyes his hunger to consume your lies in your lack of compromise he will ask to make a portrait singer gogan yes i came to pick you up your brother will all send for you ah yes It's hot here. Yes, always. It's the humidity. We're going to an island far away from the city. Yes, it's away. You will do good work there. Your brother in law said you make portraits. Here I am in Panama. In excellent health as always. The voyage was tough. Bad weather and third class passengers packed like sheep. In eight days time, we should be on our tiny island, living like savages. And I assure you theirs is not the unhappiest lot. 
The first view of this part of the island is closed. It's nothing very extraordinary. Nothing, for instance, that could be compared with the magnificence of Rio de Janeiro. The new place I had arrived to was a burden. It was like what I already knew I had thought to shake off. And that, under the circumstances of snobbery, imitation, grotesque, even to the point of caricature of our customs, fashions, vices. Was I to have made this journey to find the very thing which I fled? I was hopeful to find in this place my happiness. So I began making that piece about Gauguin because I had seen a show at MoMA which I felt was really mythologizing. In part, it was his own mythology of his own identity, of having gone to the Pacific Islands. Um, and then in my research, I realized he was half Peruvian, had grown up in Peru <laughs> until he was about nine or 10. And I was so interested in his like, you know, the multiplicity of his identity and and then sort of the confusion and his desire to, you know, it's also a Darwinian desire. And, and they were, a lot of people were interested in this, you know, being closer to animality and sexuality. There was this like interest in reinventing himself. And a lot of it was tied to sex and sexuality and his sexual identity. But he first went to Panama before going to the South Seas and was just like crushed by it, got really ill worked in the in the canal and like wound up in the hospital and just like thought the place was just like you know not not exotic enough he wasn't finding the the purity he was looking for um and I just thought that idea of purity you know and was was so interesting and so most of the dialogue from this comes directly from his um, writing in his book, Noah Noah. There's some that's mine, but most of it is his. Um, I'll show you one more clip of this. Um, and, and then I'll show you a couple more clips. I had wished for a long time to make a portrait of one of my neighbors, a young woman of seemingly pure extraction, as there were few on the island. One day she finally became emboldened enough to enter my hut and look at my work that hung on the walls. She regarded the Olympia for a long time and with special interest. What do you think of her? She's very beautiful. Had she then a sense of the beautiful? Is she a wife? Yes. While she was curiously examining the work, I, without her noticing it, made her portrait. He saw and cried out, no, and fled. Okay, so then, um, you know, I was also very interested in the fact that Gauguin was using photographs. Some of some of the paintings that we know are were, were initially photographs. And actually this image, this photograph I made before making the film, and it really helped me to understand how I would make the film aesthetically. Um, and I tend to work like that sort of intuitively. Um, this is a collage that I included in a show that I had of the final um, of the screening, which I showed in two different iterations. Um, and then I included work that was sort of like documentary of these women I knew in Panama. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I like, I like this idea of this being sort of like an ethnographic like artifact. And that's sort of how I see it in this bigger project. Um, This is the first iteration of that show that I had in Panama at a gallery that has closed since then that I worked with. Um, and the video was, you know, small and it was in a screen in a, in a, um, a monitor. Um, and then I showed it at Smack Mellon and I was able to project it. And this is sort of more representational of how I imagined how the images would interact. And I wanted it to really feel like museumography like I really wanted to kind of recreate that experience of walking into a museum and sort of like the the, the narrative that the the curators are telling through the the space and the architecture of the museum um so this is a photograph I made for the next piece that I made that year actually I got some funding and I could make another piece kind of quickly and it's the dying Cavendish and it's about um it's about um 
it's about it's about the banana and and the importance of of united fruit throughout Panama and Costa Rica and all these Central American countries. So I'll show you a, a short clip of that. idea what we were seeing. We couldn't see the details, make out the vast nuances or value the differences of the endless jungle. The Panama disease used to kill everything. The only solution was to get a hold of new lands. So when one farm died off, another was planted. One would die, another was planted. One would die, another was planted. When you see the narrowing genetic culture, that's when you know things are going to die. UFC, Puritan superior, are we? Broke no sweat, manufacturing desire, creating our banana empire. Off the bodies we miserably hire. UFC. your life it's all for the banana cream pie we did good by our shareholders UFC so okay <laughs> Um, let me see. Wait, actually, sorry. Um, hmm, that's funny. I thought that I had shown, oh, you know what it is? It's that I wanted to show another clip. Um, how are we doing on time, Laurie? Do we have? Let's see. Um, we got about five minutes. Okay. Okay. That's good. So I'll show a tiny bit of this and then I'll show one more little clip and then... Enfermo. It's Panama disease. I would invite you to sit with me, but I may not get up. Como te paso? Jeans. Cavendish are homogeneous. Who knew homogeneity would be our bet? Originally, I was Minor Keith from Brooklyn. Railroad builder. I started selling bananas to the American consumer. Mi hizo muy rico. Now I am a dying Cavendish. Do you feel sorry for me? No. You know me siento triste. there is that the Cavendish is like a non-sexual fruit you know it's not planted with seeds it's planted with um like stems and um it's it's the sec this the Cavendish banana is is thought to be um dying you know because of fungus 
um, called Panama disease, actually. And I just thought it was so interesting when I came up, when I discovered that that name and, and, and that whole phenomenon. And that it's the second time that a banana that we all eat as consumers um, dies and, you know, the species dies. And so I was really interested in using that as a metaphor for what I felt was happening in our culture. Um, and this is a more recent, this is my, my last um, film, which is started out as documentary material of my mother around the time when the child separation crisis was happening. I was feeling so much anxiety and I was um, not knowing what to do with it. And I started uh, just asking, interviewing my mother about, you know, all of her earliest experiences and learning things I hadn't known. And then I just chose to, with a lot of debate, um, to take that material and to have an actor perform it. So I'll show you a little bit of this. Um, Monday at around 4.45 or something like that, I was walking, you know, usually I walk on the other side of the street, but this time I was walking on the right side leading to a building. And this woman had come out already with her dog. And I passed by her and she stumped her feet when I was passing by. Nori completely. Then she took off in her bicycle with her dog. It, she has a bicycle there with a chain chain to some post and and took off with the dog in in other words the dog runs with her riding the bicycle which i mean i've seen that already but in new york city with all the cars you know i called the detective at the precinct and and of course, he says, do you know her name? Maybe she lives with family. I don't know anything. I don't know her name. I mean, has that ever happened to you before? She's constantly accosting me. I mean, this is not the first time. The other thing that she does that is dangerous is that when she sees me coming, she will extend her leash let her leash loose so this dog can to intimidate you <laughs> not to intimidate me but to tell me that she can command this dog to attack me because that's how i interpret it okay <laughs> so um uh there, I have a few more clips of that, but we're running out of time. So I'll just show you a couple more things that are more recent. Um, again, I, I tend to work this way where like I make sketches photographically that might then lead to like bigger films and I'm aiming to make a bigger film um, very much about American history and contemporary politics. And so this is some of that um, that is sort of like you know, stands as, as its own as photographs, but will also lead to something else. This is an image that I included of, of the monograph I published um, last year with Chris Graves. Um, I'm proud of it. You know, it came out during COVID <laughs> where there were no, when there were no book fairs. Um, please check it out if you can. I think Chris is having a book fair actually in late July in New York. Um, and so that concludes my my presentation. I'll stop sharing if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, there, there is a lot to lot to talk about, and I don't know. I feel like um, I want to talk about the photography um, uh, because that was my introduction to you. Um, yeah. And and please, p p everybody, um, either unmute yourself or, or or raise your hand, and we'll we'll talk about that. But um, uh, the work with your, I, I feel like the, the stills, even the movie stills are the ones that help us stop and help us unpack, you know, um, the collage, even the later collages, um, about the issues that you're working on. And, um, and I find it interesting because the, the, the films are just one shot, you know, they're just one shot. <laughs> And then the dialogue happens in them. And so it just feels like they're contained in these 
in these in these rectangular rectangles. Yeah. Um, um, I guess I don't know what that what my question would be right now because I'm still swimming with all of the dialogue and the and the language. Um, yeah, that's yeah. I I mean I think I agree with you that um, there's a real in, there's a real connection between the photographs and how I'm making the films and photography and the fact that I'm making them as a photographer, mm -hmm. um, but interested in words too. You know, I think that words and the somatic in, in the body. And I think that that's sort of what has led me to working with actors and to working with film is to, to really present that. Um, and, and I do see it as like an extension of the photographs uh, really. Um, yeah. How much does your mom, I mean, the way your mom embodied all the roles, um, how much did she, um, did she bring into these images and, and was she, I mean, I would imagine that she has, uh, so much first person experience that I, the pictures say so much, but I also would be very, very interested in, um, your mom's understanding of the photographs as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, she really enjoyed making them. She got them from the very start. There was no like feeling that she wasn't understanding what I was going for. I mean, she really, um, you know, my mother's like a very progressive political person. I grew up um, in a really political household. So that wasn't, but what I think that I was trying to talk to was the internalization that we all carry with us, whether that's un unconscious and the internal, the internalized trauma and the internalized um, self image that we carry um, from the, the, the effect of, uh, you know, ideology and colonization. I think that that was the part that I was interested in, in, in sort of like talking to. Um, and, and I think that she, I think, you know, it's like, uh, I think her, her body and her face just represents that, you know, without even trying very much, you know, she's just like, you know, she represents all that history and she doesn't have to do very much. And I just had to change her wardrobe and she could embody that history and and all of the feelings and all of the unconscious stuff it just like kind of like comes right up um and a lot of it is like her posturing her, her stance and how she stands and sort mm -hmm. of like how she um you know emotes like she, she really like there's a lot of like um you know there's a lot of feeling that that comes out of her without having to do very much um mm -hmm. you know and, and some of it is, you know, that, um, you know, there's like a certain way in which um, she's very Caribbean, like there's a real Caribbean quality to sort of like her positioning and her posturing mm -hmm. that I always recognized um, as being distinctly Caribbean. And, I, and, and that was very interesting to me. I really wanted to like, you know, represent that too, mm -hmm. um, like a certain pride and a certain like you know, like a certain, <laughs> it's a certain physicality. It's really interesting. So yeah, um, I was interested in that. I have a, I would like to actually ask you to bring up um, photos, the later ones with the collage and the contemporary portraits with the historical, because those you went by kind of fast and, okay. um, and that there seemed to be a lot, lot that I would love to hear more about in those okay. pieces because they're, they're very interesting too. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll um, go back, let me see. Thank um, you. Okay. Um, I'm not asking you to go backwards, but. Well, don't, <laughs> don't feel bad. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm so conscious of like our time, I'm trying to like. Um, oh, and so, I just wanted to say the beautiful, uh, those portraits of the girls in, in mm -hmm. nature are so beautiful. Yeah. And yeah, so I love them too. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, it's, it was so, yeah, it's, it's so interesting, you know, like when, to look, to be able to look back and like kind of oh. remember where you were with it. Um, you know, I will say also like, for instance, this is um, my, my husband's family. Um, let me see this, this is a family portrait and mm -hmm. um, 
like this to me is like completely emblematic of the Caribbean. You know, it's just like, you know, the three brothers, they all kind of look, have different skin shades. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't even know they're from the same family. And that is also, that was also an influence in making the project because I was making it, you know, and having also my fam, my own mother's family, but also my husband's family. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I mean, um, so this is really, this is work that I've been making kind of slowly, partly because I've been doing so much research that it's it's a lot about American, U, uh, US Latin American history and really trying to sort of, you know, years and years ago before I committed to studying psychoanalysis, I was like, should I get a PhD in Latin American history or American history? Like those are both really, you know, like I felt again, it was this liminal experience and I felt like they, really needed it really needed to be one story which is why like you know for instance this term latinx which is a relatively recent term that's being used i know there's a lot of controversy around it for you know different reasons with the x part because it's you know it's like genderless but i do feel a sort of sense of relief that there is a word a title to describe what so many people in this country experience which is to live in this liminal ex, you know space and to recognize the massive historical implication and history that the US had in Latin America with you know like overthrowing and murdering uh, <laughs> you know like elected people like um you know, in Chile or in Guatemala, what the CIA did in Guatemala was crazy, you know, like, like faking recording, recordings to like scare the population into thinking, you know, all, all that manipulation. So like this project really is, is really like trying to do that, um, which is to focus on that history. Um, and um, yeah, and pay attention. I it. I mean, they look, they have, they have incredible depth. I mean, it's very interesting. They look like stage sets, right? They, yeah. they look like theater sets. And, um, and uh, I, I just really love them. Uh, are you making the collage um, in Photoshop or is that, are, are they real sets? I mean, you know, have no, you- No, they're real set. I mean, some of it is Photoshop, like um, like the arm, for instance, giving away my secrets, but no, the backgrounds are photographs that are blown up and they're okay. real sets. Yeah, they're real sets um, and pieces. So it's like a combination. Um, and yeah, and this and this is sort of like, I mean, they stand alone, but they are going to become part of a bigger film that I'm hoping to make um, in in about a year, <laughs> you know? So yeah, um, I, you know, again, it's like, I feel like, I feel like I explore things recently in the last decade, I guess, with stills and with moving image. It's like, I, it's harder for me to just make, um, two-dimensional things and not consider and and part of it is that I think that my practice has grown so much more research-based and I'm so much more interested in text and dialogue and speech and 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 this really all came out through um my practice in psychoanalysis and and my work in psychoanalysis where I just was so moved by all the information that would surface in mm. people's stories, really. It was like, I felt so privileged to be able to hear people's, you know, personal stories. Um, and that kind of moved me in this direction of, of really being interested in finding individual stories that can then talk to, you know, these, these moments in history. Can, can you go back to the... Um... Uh, these are wonderful. I th I'm really, um, I I'm excited for you. Um, can you go back to the collages um, that, uh, those, yeah, yeah. those. Um, can you talk a little bit about those? Because those went by really fast as well. And, okay. <laughs> and uh, obviously your titles are really important. I love the titles and the way they're working with the images. Yeah, the titles. So these are straight from Gauguin's Noah Noah book. Like this was, you know, this is him. 
and his language and what the things he's saying. Um, and then I, I just would pair up like his, his quotes basically with the collages. Um, so that's, that's what, how I'm using the titles, um, except this one. This one is, these are the names of these two women who I knew a little bit. Um, I love that portrait too. Yeah, I love it too. Um, you know, and I, I feel like I, I started out, as you all saw, as an environmental portrait photographer, <laughs> and then it just like took on a whole different arc. But at the core, I still feel like I'm still in like a portraiture, you know, headspace. I'm still just so interested in people and individuals and their lives and their stories and connecting with them. And I love what happens in that space that I'm photographing someone like what they're presenting to me I mean I don't mind you tell I don't mind telling you that these women took like two hours if not three to like get ready for this picture mm. and I didn't have any problem with that because they wanted to look really beautiful and I wanted that for them do you know like I love how people choose to represent themselves you know like that to me like I let people really do what they want when I'm in a space like this um which is different from this, which is like, I'm really doing so much directing, but I do notice that I tend to, I think when I'm making photographs, I tend to really love people that are still themselves. Like I don't, it's, it's, I've photograph, I've tried photographing actors and I don't like that as much. Like I need for um, the, the portraits when they're stills to kind of be portraits. So like, it's kind of what I'm having her play, like a role I'm having her play, but it's also kind of her, you mm. know, she's really kind of being herself. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, I'd like to hear from any of any men in the audience, because I completely identify with, with every, whenever there's a man and a woman in the frame, I'm just thinking it's about the woman, right? Even though you're talking about Gauguin. So I'm just curious if, if any of the men in here feel that because yeah, uh, it, you're very, I mean, obviously your work has really been centered around women's experience and women's lives, yeah. um, girls, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. Um, I, I don't have enough men tell me what they think, but <laughs> feel free. <laughs> I would be interested. Um, uh, even when they're in front of the camera, you're just like looking around for where the women's perspective is. I, yeah. I, mean, I was, but that, that's also me. It could be my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody have any, any questions for Rochelle? Because we've just been chatting away. I know. No. Um, so the film that's coming up, my dear, film mm -hmm. that's coming up, and it's based on yeah. some of the collages. Um, what what uh, what is your what is the thinking? About, what is your hope? So the film that's coming up is um, it's really a, the origin story of of the country and the nation, and it's really talking about magical thinking and. Puritans and um, it's probably going to have more than one chapter, but that's going to be the first chapter. So that's what I'm working on and, you know, connecting it to contemporary um, phenomenons in our culture with magical thinking. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on. Yeah. I can see the, um, I don't know, it just took me all the way through your entire presentation that, that, <laughs> that, that premise, um, because I can see um, how magical thinking has been manifested um, in, in the scenarios that you've created, but also just uh, in all of the work. That's, that's yeah. perfect. That's a perfect next step. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, we'll see. Where does your work, where your films are shown in museums, but are they, do they also play elsewhere? So, I mean, institutions and museums, I haven't, I've, I haven't really pushed like festival circuit, um, but a friend tells me I should. So maybe I will try that. Um, <laughs> but, um, but really mostly institutions and, you know, museums, that's, that's where I've been showing it. Okay. Yeah. 
Great. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much um, for sharing your work. Thank you so it much. Went by very fast. Yeah. Thank um, you for for inviting me. Um, yeah, you can. You know, anyone who would like to reach out and ask me questions, um, you can definitely do that. So. Yeah. I, I hope to stay in touch and, and good luck with the next work. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight. Next, next week, um, Naomi Joven will be presenting her work. She's an artist in residence at PPAC. So I hope to see you again next week. Rochelle, be well. You too. Thank you okay, so much. See you soon.